we're, 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 we're having a hard time getting this train out of the station this morning. Um, but I hope you're all having a good time enjoying each other's company and uh, celebrating. We've, uh, we've managed to locate all of the kids that we needed to locate, I think. So they're all here somewhere. I do want to share a couple of announcements before we begin this morning. One, oh, you're waving at Marta. Hi, Marta. Um, so uh, during the week, uh, the musettes have been practicing here in the church, and it's been awesome to hear them uh, getting ready for their Christmas uh, concert. How many of you are familiar with the musettes? Um, most of you have, have, have kind of had some experience. It's a, it's a women's choral group. They do a beautiful Christmas concert every year. This year, the Christmas concert is here. Um, so we want to let you folks know a little bit about that. It is coming up on the uh, December 9th, Friday, December 9th at 7 o'clock in the evening here at the church. Um, also on Saturday the 10th at 2 p.m. in the afternoon here at the church. Either one of those, you'd be welcome to come. Come to both of them if you want. I can tell you right now, it's going to be good because they've been, it's just beautiful coming down the hallway. So uh, I just want to encourage you to, to, uh, to uh, make time for that, if you will. They will be taking a free will offering to kind of defray some of the costs and so forth. You're all on top of all their sound stuff, right, Mark? I'm just getting that clear in my head here. <laughs> because if it's up to somebody else, I don't know if I could do it. It'll be fantastic. So uh, they're going to be here doing those concerts. They're also going to join us next Sunday for this service and offer two songs uh, that are part of their program for us in our worship. And so I want to encourage you to uh, come to that. Invite your friends and uh, say, this is what we do every Sunday, which isn't really true, but uh, um, <laughs> it is nice in the Christmas season to be able to have that opportunity to uh, celebrate with that special uh, offering that they're bringing. That was not an appropriate joke, was it? <laughs> Don't tell them the truth. Tell them, you know, it's like... It's a good place whether we have special music or not. Um, so that's coming up. I just want to let folks know about that. There's a few things, too, on our usual Wednesday night things. Those are all printed in your bulletin in the calendar of events, and so you can check those out. Uh, this is the Christmas season. This is our, the first Sunday of Advent. Um, we do some uh, 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 offering, special offerings and special uh, uh, giving during the holiday season. Uh, Leroy has a little bit of information about the Love, Inc. family that we, we sponsor every year, so I'll let him start that out and then yes you're not mark is going to start the service so you get to do this hi yeah uh, this every year we sponsor a family from love inc for christmas and this year we don't have a family we have a couple they have no kids but they've got a pretty good list of things they would like to have but there are most of them are a little more than i want to ask an individual to do so we're going to ask everybody to donate money between now and the 11th. Every Sunday we'll be taking part of the offering. And then uh, we're going to go buy gift cards where they can go and get the items that they have asked for. And then uh, we'll be also providing the Christmas dinner for them as well. Thank you. Good morning. Hey, it's uh, not so sunny, so we don't have to bring the shades down and up, so you won't hear that motor going on and up. For, so anyway, good morning and welcome for the uh, starting out. I'm going to be reading from Psalms, uh, Psalms 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. That everything that breathes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So... Um, if you would, uh, join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to come together and worship you. To listen to your word, open our hearts so that we may understand it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For the scripture reading, I'm going to be reading from 
Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. In days to come, oh, excuse me, the word that Isaiah son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he may teach us his ways, and we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall be judged between the nations, and shall, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. If you would all stand with me, we are going to start with O Come All Ye Faithful on 212. for my hope is built on nothing less.
For the offering, I'll be reading Exodus 35, verses uh, 4 through 10. Moses said to the congregations of the Israelites, This is the thing the Lord has commanded. Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Let whoever is generous of heart bring the Lord's offering, gold, silver, bronze, purple, blue, and crimson yarn, and fine linens, goat's hair tan, tanned ram's skins, and fine leather, acacia, wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant of incense, and onyx stones and gems to be set in the ephod and the breastpiece. All who are skillful among, among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded the tabernacle. Please stand and join me in singing the doxology. Praise God. Be 
received. Down to the <laughs> if you'd all stand with me as we sing, Oh, Little Town of Bethlehem.
and we have a source of inextinguishable hope that we can turn to if we need to light the candle again. So, Traditionally, we would be reading out of the first part of the Gospels, Matthew 1 and 2. Today, I want to go to the end of the Gospel, near the end. Jesus is sharing some last words, if you will, with his disciples. From the 24th chapter, beginning in the 36th verse, Jesus tells them, But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away, so too will be the coming of the Son of Man." Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The historic Fort Laramie is not in Laramie, Wyoming. I had to look that up. I didn't realize that, but that is the case. It's actually about 100 miles northeast of Laramie, Wyoming, about 20 miles west of the Nebraska state line. Fort Laramie was a significant site along the Pioneer Route West. The 49ers went through there on their way to the California gold diggings, and the Mormons stopped there on their way through to Salt Lake, the basin, and tens of thousands of immigrants traveled past the fort on their way to the Oregon Territory. Fort Laramie was originally a fur trapper's outpost. They built it back in the early part of the 1800s. The American Fur Company set up their site there at the confluence of the meandering Laramie River and the North Platte, that came in on the north side. The U.S. government purchased the fort back in 1849 to protect all of these travelers who were making their way west, but the outpost always had a commercial element to it. They had what they called a sutler's store, and it did a brisk business selling supplies to the immigrants, the coffee, the tea, the the flour and sugar and lard, the other staples that they would need, the tools and ammunition, the firearms, all the replacements for that stuff that had gotten lost or used up or damaged on the trail. The blacksmith of the fort also worked from sun up to sun down, repairing and refitting the wagons in that short window of time that they were able to get through. For many of them, the trip so far had been a tough one. It had been hard for them, but the going was relatively level. There was water all along the way. But at Fort Laramie, the settlers were headed into that dry Wyoming desert and then up into the Rocky Mountains. At Fort Laramie, they had to make some choices. The settlers ended up renaming Fort Laramie Camp Sacrifice because that's where they had to make their sacrifices. The story goes that that flat ground there around the fort was literally just scattered with all the cast-off supplies and and things that the immigrants had to abandon. Back in Independence, Missouri, they were told what they should bring and what they shouldn't bring. But a lot of them carried some precious stuff from their past, the items that they were convinced that they were going to need once they got to Oregon. They had cast iron cook stoves and crates full of fine china, pianos, Boxes of books, horse-drawn plows, all of these things taking up space and adding weight. Rolling up to Fort Laramie with their exhausted livestock and their broken wagons and their limited supplies, the settlers had to look at what they had and make some difficult decisions about what was really necessary. All these things that they'd brought with them, they were all important, They were all significant. There's no denying that that each item that occupied some space there in the back of their wagons was something that they had carefully chosen to put there. It wasn't like they were just throwing stuff in there at the last minute. 
But were these things that they brought with them necessary to get the job done? Cook stoves? Yeah, that's important if you want to cook food. It's unlikely that they'd get to Oregon into the Willamette Valley and find a shop that had cook stoves for them to buy. And so it made sense back in Missouri when they were packing up the wagon, let's put that in there too. We spent a lot of money on it after all. But here, on this flat, dusty, windblown river bottom in Wyoming, that cook stove didn't make as much sense. It had been a struggle to get it to this point. It was dangerous, excessive weight, and it would kill them if they kept it. And so as much as it pained them, the settlers would sacrifice what they wanted to hang on to what they needed. Preparation is important. But we really, we do need to be prepared for what is actually in front of us. Our expectations, our desires, the things that we want to happen, these are the things that we normally prepare for. But the trail in front of us may require something different. We are in the Advent season. As we enter into this season, it's a season of getting ready, preparing, if you will. This year, we're celebrating hope on this first Sunday of Advent. Hope, and, and as we heard, it's close friend, preparation. What we hope for, the things that we desire, these are the things that we prepare for. If we hope to set up a comfortable home with all of the modern conveniences out on the Oregon frontier, then we pack a cast iron cook stove in the wagon. But as the settlers found as they reached Fort Laramie, what they hoped for wasn't necessarily what was actually in front of them. There was a lot of hope and expectation that led up to Christ's birth, his first coming. And so what people hoped for, they prepared for. But again, was the future that they were preparing for actually what they were going to encounter? And for us, are our hopes directed at the proper sort of preparation? Isaiah is a wonderful book. For those that have been in our adult Bible study, you, you recognize this. It, it's got just so many hints that point forward to the coming of the Messiah. There's so much of this that, that, that's contained in this book that some Christian commentators have actually called it the fifth gospel. It's from Isaiah that we get so many of those well-known passages that we read during the Christmas season, the passages about Emmanuel, God with us, and for unto us a child is born, and, and Isaiah 40 has all that stuff about the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make the way straight. The hope and the promise of salvation that's woven all through Isaiah, it clearly points to the redemptive work of the Messiah. Isaiah understood it. He may not have had a clear picture of who it would be, but he could see it coming. There's so much in this book that if you're looking at things through a Christian viewpoint, they all just, you can't help but connect these things to Jesus. The gospel writers were the first to do this. They saw in Isaiah's work a uh, reference to Jesus. But not everybody. Particularly back in Isaiah's day, following Isaiah's day, not everyone saw the same things. What they hoped for and what they prepared for was not actually what was in front of them. In that second chapter of Isaiah, we, we have this picture of a, of a day of peace. I hope you heard the words that Mark read to us and, and, and let them take a little space in your heart. He talks about the mountain of the Lord's house. That's clearly a reference to Jerusalem and the temple there. And it says that all the nations would come to it. All the nations would stream to it. For, and that was, for a lot of people, a clear indication that the Lord, and by extension the Lord's people, would rule over all of these nations that were coming to Jerusalem. The way of God. And again, the way of the people of God. That would be what everybody, what the whole rest of the world longed for. And because that reign of God, that place on that high mountain, would be perfect and would it, be, it would be just, there would be no need for any of the weapons of war anymore. No swords, no spears, only plowshares and pruning hooks. So I want you to envision that picture that Isaiah is giving the people in that. I want you to think about it from the perspective of somebody that's, that's right in the middle of Jewish society. 
maybe a few decades after Isaiah wrote this stuff down. But you've just returned from this terrible experience of exile. Those of you who remember the story, the, the children of Israel, the, the people of Judah, had been taken into exile by the Babylonians, and then Cyrus, the king of the Persians, allowed them to return. And they're coming back into the land, and they're repatriating it. You see, what had happened was that these, these people, these children of Israel, the people of Judah, they'd been caught up in all of the machinations, all the marching of empire. You think about all these different empires that they, that they encountered. The Assyrians at first, huge warlike empire. The Babylonians came and took over for the Assyrians. The Persians came over and took over from the Babylonians. And the people of, of Judah, they had just been pawns in all this. They'd just been shuttled back and forth, kicked around like a soccer ball. They couldn't stand up for themselves. They didn't have that kind of power, that kind of strength. They just had to kind of take it. They just had to absorb whatever it was that these empires wanted to do. Now there's a clear connection here between their own personal disobedience, the, 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 the way that they had abandoned God and the problems that they encountered. Isaiah makes that very clear. But we learn in the 40th chapter of Isaiah's book that that time is now past. That time of hard service is over. It's ended. And that they had been invited to come back, to return to Jerusalem, to rebuild the city. Great news, right? They're excited about it. They're leaving Babylon with joy and they're coming to Jerusalem in peace. But I don't want you to get the idea that it's all roses for them because it's not. They are not free at this point. They are still subject to the Persian Empire. They still have to fill out their checks every, every so often and send the tribute back to the emperor. They're not free. They'd return to their ancestral home, yes, but they were still subjects. They're not autonomous. They can't make their own decisions. And they won't be able to make their own decisions. They won't be free again. There's just a, a short window of time in history where the Maccabees ruled in Jerusalem. But other than that, there was, it's just one empire after another. Like the Assyrians gave way to the Babylonians who gave way to the Persians. The Persians gave way to the Greeks. The Greeks gave way to the Romans. It's just one after the other. The people of Judah are under the thumb of an empire from, from that point on. So I want you to think about this passage, this Isaiah 2 passage, from the perspective of somebody who just endured decades of oppression under the control of a hostile empire that was trying to, their best to do away with them. To have, they would cease to be, cease to exist as a people. And that oppression that they felt, it was physical oppression. They actually had some physical consequences to them being captive and taken into, into that exile. It was a religious oppression because it seemed to them that their God, Yahweh, was somehow weaker than this God that was ruling the, the, the Babylonians and then the, the Persians after them. So there was a religious oppression. It was also political I mean, this is an empire. This is a way of organizing things. It's cultural. It's totally different than the way that they lived. And so when the prophet starts talking about nations in that second chapter, it's a short step for them to start thinking that this promised time, the one that, 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 that has all of this time when the nations are going to come to God's holy mountain and learn about God's ways, it's, it's not difficult for them to think of that in political and nationalistic terms. They might see it as a cultural deliverance, not a spiritual deliverance, which is really what it is. We get to Jesus' time, we see this happening. We know that this is what's going on, the expectations for a political deliverance, a cultural deliverance. That was just as strong then. That zealot movement that you hear about, these, these guys that are running around trying to overthrow the Roman government, that's political. They want to get rid of this political empire so that they can set up their own cultural and political empire. The complicity of the Sadducees, again, cultural, political. I want you to think of it this way. The, the people of Judah, 
They just returned to Jerusalem after this long exile in Babylon for all those years. They're being told by Isaiah that there's a promise in front of them. There's something coming that they can look forward to. This return to Jerusalem, it's good, but it wasn't really what they wanted. They wanted to be free. They were still being controlled by this pagan empire. They weren't in charge, and that's really what they wanted. The nations weren't coming to them like the scripture tells them that they would. They had to go to the nations and at, with hat in hand for whatever they needed. And so this picture that Isaiah is painting for them is a very attractive one. Yes, they say, that's what we want. And they read these words. And they reread these words. And they go back to them year after year, generation after generation. It's easy to get that idea of a cultural, a political, a nationalistic superiority in their heads. I mean, this is what God is going to do for us in the future. We're pretty, pretty cool folks. I mean, you look at the text again, Isaiah 2. The mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all the mountains. The nations will all stream to it. All the people will submit to God, our God, in that place. And as if probably a lot of them were thinking, if we're with God, then they're submitting to us too. We're in charge. Not a lot of space there between this idea of God's mountain, God's dwelling place, and their cultural and, and political vision of Jerusalem, which happened to belong to them. You see, you have to understand that I, the, the illustration that came to mind for me was Pokemon. You, anybody familiar with Pokemon? If you've got grandkids, you probably are, but uh, I'm not going to go into that, but the idea is that Pokemon, you've got these little creatures who do your fighting for you. That's kind of the way that these empires and these nations viewed their gods, you want the strongest God. And if your God beats their God, if you go into battle with them and your God gives you victory over them, that means their God is weaker. It's almost like the, that if you've got the most powerful God on your side, you've got a handful of trump cards, to use another game analogy. And you can just take every trick. Because your God's more powerful than their God. And because that's the way that all of the neighbors thought the children of Israel might have got to think in that way too. They ended up treating Yahweh as the most powerful God, not because of Yahweh's inherent power, not because of Yahweh's inherent sovereignty or majesty, but because Yahweh could get for them what these other gods got for their people. Political and cultural power and control. See, what they were hoping for led them to prepare for the Messiah in a way that did not reflect the way the Messiah was really going to come. In essence, they're hollowing a cultural and a political cook stove into the rugged mountains. Not everybody, obviously. There's a few folks around before Christ comes who were anticipating the Messiah in a way that reflected the reality. There were people like Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. There were those prophets, Simeon and Anna, who were waiting for the, 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 the revelation of what God was going to do. There was this young girl who, when she was confronted with this unanticipated future, was ready at a moment's notice to jettison whatever she didn't need and to faithfully follow the Lord into this new future. You take a look at Luke 1, Mary's song there, it's beautiful. It lets us in on how she's seeing the road in front of her. She sees the Lord as merciful and gracious, as one who cares about the marginalized and the downtrodden, as one who would lift up the hungry and cast down the proud. She saw what was really in front of her. And because she saw more clearly that path that was in front of her, she hoped for the right things, then Mary was prepared, probably better than anybody. Now, there was some clear divine preparation there, too. I doubt that she would have reached that point if, if the angel hadn't come to her and brought her that message. But regardless, Mary was prepared. She had her hope in the right place. She saw things clearly. She carried only what she needed. 
Advent, Advent's a time for us to remember the first coming of Jesus. I always kind of find it interesting. We, 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 we look forward with anticipation to something that happened in the past. And that's, that's what you do. That is how we kind of celebrate this time. And that first coming of Jesus was an anticipated event. It was something that people were getting ready for. They were hoping for it. They were preparing for it. But a lot of folks, their vision of what was coming and, and the coming of the Messiah, it was not always the same. They didn't always see things the way that they were. Some thought it would be this political, cultural shift. They prepared for that future. Others, a few of them, knew that it would be a spiritual future first that would ripple out from there into a cultural and a political reality in time. One group saw the coming of the Messiah as a vindication for their own position, a validation of their own power and their own control. The Messiah, the Messiah is the trump card that we get to play and say, yep, now we win, we're in charge. Others had a better idea. A sense that the coming of the Messiah would be more about God reasserting his authority, not affirming or supporting the supposed authority of any earthly empire or people. If you were hoping that the Messiah would mean that you got to be in charge, then you're hoping for the wrong thing. Your preparations for that hope would be meaningless. But if you're hoping that the Messiah would mean that God would be in charge, then your hope and your preparations would not have been wasted. There were a lot of agents, uh, guides, people uh, in Independence, Missouri, who were ready to hopper, offer help to the immigrants that were setting out on the Oregon Trail. Isaiah's words were like one of those immigrant guides in Independence. The settlers who traveled on the trail, they weren't stupid people. I mean, we, we sometimes think that, boy, they should have known better not to take a cook stove. They're not stupid folks. They're smart. They're savvy. They knew a lot about what it took to make it around, to, to travel the rough roads in this brand new nation. They knew about how to take care of livestock. That's how they got around all the time. They knew how to handle a wagon. They, they, they could cook over an open fire and at the drop of a hat. They could sleep outside. They could shoot a deer and butcher it right there on the trail. They could start fire, bake bread in a Dutch oven. They could do all of that stuff. They were smart folks. What they didn't know was exactly what was in front of them. That was new. That was uncharted. They didn't know how long the road was. They didn't know what it was that they needed to, to get over that road. And they could get information there in independence. Some of it good, some of it not so good. And as smart as they might have been, they were still people who carried their own desires, their own hopes, their own vision. And all of that together, their, their information, their desire, their hope, that all influenced what they ended up putting in their wagons. It shaped how they prepared. When they got to Fort Laramie, to camp sacrifice, they were forced to make some choices. Either accept that the reality in front of them was not what they had anticipated, not what they expected, not what they had prepared for, and jettison what they didn't need, or ignore that frontier wisdom that was found there and then just travel on in ignorance. The story goes that the first part of the trail was littered with things that they threw out of their wagons and the last part of the trail was littered with their graves. Jesus, the Messiah himself in this passage from Matthew 24 is offering us some of that frontier wisdom. He's helping us prepare properly. He's saying, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that don't lighten their wagons. They're carrying on as if nothing in front of them is any different than what's been behind them. They're doing all of the things that they've always done. Getting up in the morning, going to bed at night. Working, recreating, marrying, being given in marriage. They're not getting rid of the cook stove. 
Jesus is saying that what's in front of them, what's in front of us, it's unprecedented. You have not traveled this trail before. It's unpredictable. It's like nothing that you've already come through. And the best thing that you can do to face this is to be ready, to be prepared, to stay awake in the right way. The illustration that Jesus uses is of a thief breaking into a house. If the owner of the house knows when the thief is coming, are they going to be sleeping during that time? No. They're going to be awake and ready. They're going to be awake and they're going to catch the thief. And Jesus says exactly that. Be ready for what is in front of you. Be prepared. There's some unpredictable things, sure. But if you're ready, if you're awake, you'll be fine. Just don't carry the things that you shouldn't. Lighten your wagon. You see, everybody that sets out on a journey has a destination in mind. That's the definition of a journey. Otherwise, it's just wandering around aimlessly. If you're on a journey, you're going to a place. You're going somewhere. It's not a journey without a destination. But our vision of what that destination might be isn't always accurate. What we hope for it may not be what is in front of us, either the destination or the journey itself. And if our vision of what is in front of us is flawed, if it's off, if it's inaccurate, then we're probably not going to be prepared for it, for whatever it is that we encounter. As we reflect on these stories of Advent, and we remember the way that Jesus came into the world and challenged so profoundly challenged the expectations and the hopes of so many of his fellow Jews, then we ought to ask ourselves again, what are we expecting? What are we hoping for? What is the vision that is in front of us? You see, people heard that wisdom from Isaiah. <laughs> they, the, the promise and the prophet's words, and they set out on their journey with some expectations, some hopes, and they prepared accordingly. But Jesus comes in and gives them some new wisdom, some of that frontier wisdom as they continue on their journey. And the question is, are you going to listen to it or not? The question is whether we listen to it or not. Are we prepared for what is in front of us? For this journey that we still have to make? Or are we burdened? weighed down with these encumbrances and this excess baggage? Are we continuing on our journey as if the words and the warnings of Jesus mean nothing? Still trying to make it what we want it to be instead of what God is going to make it. The way that Jesus talks about the second advent, his return, it calls to mind the unexpected nature of it. He says it's going to be like the flood in Noah's day. Unprecedented, unanticipated. People will not be prepared for it. They'll just be doing what they're doing and then, bam, it hits them. Because they're not ready. Because they're not looking for it. They're going to be working in the fields and one of them gets swept away and the other one leave, is left. They're going to be grinding grain. One gets taken the other left. That's how it's going to be, he says. It's going to be like a thief who sneaks in and grabs stuff when you're not looking. But only for one group of people. Only for those who don't see the way in front of them clearly. Those who've prepared for the wrong thing. For those that have prepared rightly... For the owner of the house who is awake when the thief comes, then the return of Jesus is not any of those things. It is not unexpected. It is not unprecedented. They've seen it coming a long way off. We have seen it coming a long way off. And we know that we're ready. We're not carrying a bunch of stuff, a bunch of baggage that we don't need. We've already dumped it on the trail. We got rid of it. Now that exact moment, that may come as a surprise. Sort of like cresting the hill, that last hill that was just like all the other hills, and then 
There it is, the land of promise. But because our vision has been clear, what we have hoped for is fixed on Jesus, we've been ready. We've been prepared. We've prepared for what we've hoped for, and that hope does not disappoint. Let's pray together. Lord God, you want us to be ready. You do not want us to be caught unawares. But being ready requires clear vision, something else that you've promised to give us. Lord, when we get distracted by the things of this world, when we value certain things above what they should be valued, when we cling to that cook stove, We pray that you would loosen our fingers. Help us to leave it. If it is not for your glory and your kingdom, help us to leave it. So that we may more faithfully follow you. Help us to put our hope in what cannot be taken away. The hope of your promise that you will come and make all things new. Lord, that is something we want to prepare for. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Stand with me once more. We're going to close with just verse 4 of O Little Town of Bethlehem. with me once again Lord we know that we are not alone as we travel this trail that you are with us you are not only our destination and the hope that we have in the future but you are our guide our advocate, our comforter along the way and so we thank you for that presence that helps us be who we need to be Lord, we will depart from this place and we will go into the world and we will carry that with us, your loving presence. It is meant to be shared, Lord, and so we pray that you would bring us into contact with those that need it so that we may love as we are loved. Lord, we pray for those that can't be with us today for whatever reason, whether they be traveling or whether illness keeps them from us. We ask for your protection, your healing, and your peace to fall upon them and bless them. And Lord, we pray for the opportunity to gather again, either with you in heaven or once again here on earth to worship you. We pray all of these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. You may go in peace.